remember the first time you cried it would have been when you were inside your mother's womb you practiced crying imitating breathing patterns and facial expressions of how you would cry once you were born into the outside world when babies are delivered most of them cry and that first cry triggers complex biological changes in your body there are a lot of studies which show that most parents respond to their baby crying instinctively you know he or she wants something food warmth movement safety silence even entertainment today crying is communication in these first few years of a person's life but then a day comes when crying becomes associated with pain emotional immaturity drama even manipulation it becomes something you should do in the privacy of a toilet stall behind giant sunglasses or under a pillow late at night i was amazed that at an empathetic healing program i once attended crying was the focus of an entire session it asked the 50 participants to share what they felt when they cried and you realized through these shared experiences that often tears don't need a response they are a response they help to heal it is the visual perception of crying in society that keeps us from fully exploring the joys of a completely natural process and this perception becomes all the more negative all the more complicated if you are male and just felt like today is the day you want to let it all out this is analia charchi and you are listening to health wealth a podcast that wants to help build understanding and enthusiasm for looking after yourself whenever i have to discuss gender based discriminatory practices around mental health i always go back to a book i read a couple of years ago it's called the hidden history of male nervous illness and it's written by mark mckell and i found two things to be very relevant and i'll briefly share them with you one in 18th century england it was actually fashionable and a sign of refinement for a man to be called nervous you would want to date a man who got sad in the winter you would be very proud if your son cried during the last shakespeare performance it meant the man had an extremely sophisticated or upper class nervous system but then somewhere when the around the time when the napoleonic war started actually there was a shift suddenly you needed macho men soldiers who were ready to fight and being nervous or bursting into tears out of the blue it, it simply wasn't done another change is how we understood the cause of one of the first known mental disorders hysteria the term is actually greek for uterus and you would know this because we still use the word hysterectomy for a uterus removal surgery but why would you use a gender term for a mental illness well because it was believed only women had hysteria it referred to a mix of symptoms sudden pain tears loss of sensation in the legs all without a known physical cause and when it first began to be diagnosed it was assumed that it was a difference in biology between men and women that led men, women to have this condition but then again somewhere in the victorian period doctors began to write and then people began to think that it was the emotional fragility and the delicacy of women that made hysteria more common amongst them and the answer at that time was a good marriage in fact you know one day i'd love to do an episode on how many times marriage has been prescribed as medicine for mental disorders and perhaps one day i will but anyhow you must be wondering what is what happened in britain have anything to do with india well you can't deny the impact of british perceptions on indian society entirely why did a land where there exist records of battle hardened emperors shedding tears and encouraging emotional romantic poetry 
suddenly also decide that big boys should not cry. Anyhow, we no longer use the term hysteria. These symptoms are now diagnosed as dissociative disorder, somatic disorder, but more importantly, medically, we no longer believe it only occurs in females. Men too suffer these conditions. But do men seek help for it? Do they speak out about it? Will they be heard if they do? The fact that the latest crime data shows that there is a 72 to 27 male to female ratio of suicide victims in this country certainly points out that there is a gendered aspect at play when it comes to seeking mental health support. To answer these questions more accurately and give us a picture of male mental health scenario in India, I have with me Dr. Shrikant Srinivasan. He is the Chief Medical Director of Niyama Digital Healthcare. Dr. Srinivasan is also a psychiatrist with over two decades of clinical experiences with both females and males. Hello, Dr. Shri. How Hello, are you? Finally. Good, thank you. How are you? Thank you so much for coming today. My pleasure. You know, I know I mean, you've been practicing for so many years now, so you must have seen a lot of people break down and cry. And I thought maybe we can just start with this, that how do you remind yourself that when someone is crying, it's not them being weak, but it's actually a sign of them opening up? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, because we are talking on this aspect of crying, with particular reference to males crying uh, and what has been my experience dealing with men crying in my practice. See, on the whole, it is true that men cry less often than women. Okay, so that is an established fact. So to the extent of uh, women cry more often than men to their tune of about two to three times more often than men. But men do cry. But uh, it is not a sign of weakness when we see men crying. Okay, because... Across the spectrum, what we always see is that when you take both women as well as men, not everybody cries to everyone. So for crying to happen, like what you mentioned at the beginning, crying is a, an expression of a need of somebody who is in distress. Okay, So it does not happen in every situation, clinical situation. So they express the distress when they find that the person to whom they're expressing this distress is sympathetic to their cause. When they find that the person is warm, the person is understanding, when they find that they can uh, persist very uh, they confidently, they can unload this distress and uh, the person is going to be sympathetic uh, uh, to their cause. So whether irrespective of the gender, crying happens only when the person uh, finds that they're going to find the other person sympathetic to their distress and other things. So mm -hmm. even though women cry more often than men, so they don't cry to everybody. So that's the first uh, thing that we will have to understand. Yeah. And this is all the more so with men, because men have always been through either due to their upbringing or due to their genetic or biological underpinnings. They've always been brought up in the milieu that uh, you will have to take it up on their chin or uh, kind of thing. And they've not been taught to unload their feelings kind of thing. So they are all the more reluctant to unload their feelings, express their emotions, mm -hmm. try it out and take it off the chest kind of thing. So they try less often, but of course they do. Under different was it circumstances. Was unusual yeah. for you? Um, sorry, I'm going to bring your gender in. Um, yeah. But was it unusual for you the first time you saw a male patient cry? Did you find that strained at all? Or, you know, did your decades of learning help with that? Yes. We... As a, a, a neuropsychiatrist, I do see men cry, but it is not as often as women. But then uh, uh, we've always been uh, trained to establish a warm therapeutic mm -hmm. relationship with our clients, irrespective mm -hmm. of the gender and other things. Actually, when, to be honest, if I'm not sounding very rude or other thing, we feel happy when we see our patients cry. Yeah. So the reason is because I know that we have broken down the barriers between yeah. my patients. They're trusting you. They're trusting yes. you. Yeah. And I feel happy that that is the moment when I've been succeeding in getting across the barriers and I've been uh, successful in establishing a therapeutic relationship. 
So I actually feel better when that happens, actually. So oh, that's lovely. We actually feel better. <laughs> that's lovely. So could you maybe briefly explain the physiology of crying? Because I know there are a lot of hormones and chemicals involved. And most people don't understand that. What happens when I start crying? Yeah, so what happens is uh, uh, when you say what happens when they cry, it's a complex neuropsychobiological mechanism. So mm-hmm. put it uh, uh, the medical basis of crying. Yeah. So the mechanism, the systems come into operation when somebody cries is that the certain muscles have to come into play, certain emotions come into play, and then you see the end result where the lacrimal glands, the tear glands secrete, and then you see the end result, which is the flow of tears from the eyes. So these musculatures that are involved are the facial musculatures, which have to make the muscles involved in the production of these uh, uh, emotional expressions, the facial expressions. And if it's a loud cry, then the vocalization that comes along with the uh, crying have to uh, act. And then the emotions that come into play have to be operative from the emotional part of the brain, which is the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and other thing. And then uh, uh, the tear glands, which are the lacrimal glands, have to get activated by a uh, uh, sudden inflow of signals from the uh, emotional part of the brain. The parasympathetic nervous system, which gets activated, sends signals to the tear glands, leading to the production of sudden onslaught and the production of tears. So these are the three basic mechanisms that come into play. And uh, you either, the tearing can be just a flow of uh, tears from the lacrimal glands, or it can be accompanied by a vocalized uh, tearing. Mm -hmm. This this is a a very simple uh, explanation of the mechanisms that happen. But this is coordinated by a central brain network, which we call the central autonomic network. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complex, widely distributed network, which Mm -hmm. has multiple nodes. Uh, one node is the uh, medial prefrontal cortex as well as the insular network which senses what happens inside the body and the other network is the uh, autonomic nervous system that includes the hypothalamic uh, regions of the brain and the amygdala which is the emotional part of the brain and you have the uh, brainstem regions the pons, the midbrain, and other things, which actually control the musculature of the vocal cords, the throat, as well as the facial movements. All these have to move in unison to produce the, the activate the muscles of the face and the throat. They have to produce the emotions that the subject feels while he's crying, and the end result of the tearing that comes with the activation of the tear glands in the eyes. It's mm-hmm. a complex network that works in unison to produce the uh, That's emotional fascinating. and the muscular. That's thing quite fascinating. Tears. And and yeah. what happens when you are done crying? Because, I mean, I, I certainly feel this that once I've shed a few tears, I feel better. So, is there something that's released that makes me feel calmer? Yes. Basically, what happens is the neurochemical basis of this particular act of uh, crying is that a lot of uh, uh, chemicals are uh, uh, they come into play. Uh, Oxytocin, which is the uh, affiliative hormone of the brain, comes mm-hmm. into play. The tear, tears themselves contain certain uh, hormones which are secreted through the tears. And then the sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic nervous systems are activated. In the presence of a warm and supportive environment, in the majority of time circumstances, crying basically helps the per- per- person unburden his emotions. Yeah. But then this is not uh, 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 ha- this does not happen in the majority of uh, cases. So mm-hmm. not everybody who cries feels better at the end of mm-hmm. crying. Maybe sixty to seventy percent of the times you feel better after you've mm-hmm. unburdened yourself by crying. But uh, this is not across all the board. It does not happen. Maybe sixty to seventy percent. But there are uh, patients. There are circumstances where you feel worse off after crying. So okay. it's not uh, it's not a dictum that you feel better after you cry. There are mm-hmm. intra-individual as well as uh, inter-individual differences uh, which determine whether you're going to feel better or whether you're going to feel worse off after crying out. Yeah. So one of the reasons, you know, I, I started off with crying is because it is the most, um, you know, something we all have to regulate emotions. But certainly, as you said, it doesn't help everyone. So for those, you know, for whom crying is also not helping, 
why is it important for them to then find other avenues of emotional support you know why shouldn't we just keep it all bottled in and be strong and you know just carry on yeah so these are what we call the different coping mechanisms that we all have okay so crying probably is one of the coping mechanisms but then each one of us in each of the different difficult circumstances that we have to deal with the different stressors that we deal with life family circumstances or work circumstances health and financial and those interpersonal difficult stressing circumstances each one of us have to be uh, intelligent enough to find out what particular coping mechanisms work best in that particular stressing circumstance right because it's not a universal thing that okay i find this best so i'm going to use this particular trick across all the stressful circumstances that i encounter no you will have to you will have to have different horses for different courses that's what we mm-hmm. always teach our patients and and what happens if a person is not allowed to release or even acknowledge any emotion that's uh, less than positive or less than you know seemingly strong how does that impact their mental physical and even their social well-being yeah so the way we uh, i'll i'll give you uh, i'll tell you how we explain this to our uh, uh, clients and patients in the clinic mm-hmm. we always bring in the pressure cooker model for example that's very simple for patients to yeah. understand yeah so we always say that pressure cooker is easy for our patients to understand you have the pressure cooker which has a lid on it and which has the uh, pressure valve which is put on it okay and then the different stressors are the uh, the heat that's constantly uh, heating up whatever is there in the pressure cooker and then everybody knows and understands that from time to time the pressure inside the steam inside has to be let out mm-hmm. if you don't do that what happens is that some accident happens and suddenly the pressure cooker bursts or there's an accident that happens mm-hmm. so this is how we uh, uh, this analogy is what we use in the yeah. uh, clinic because it's very simple yeah. for patients to understand yeah. so we tell you may cry or you may mm-hmm. have your own uh, uh, simple coping mechanism so if mm-hmm. you don't make adequate use of it then you will become like a pressure cooker where the steam is not let out from time to time so you will mm-hmm. have accidents you will have uh, 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 psychological breakdowns that may turn into a catastrophe kind of thing. yeah and and even if you don't have a full blown breakdown there are certain things which can be a lot better if you were emotionally regulated right like even things yeah. like getting snappy at work or um you know being irritable with your wife or kids you know these these exactly. all do contribute to our health right yeah you can always play upon this model so if the patient says mm. no doctor i know my my pressure cooker is not going to uh, burst mm. out of the sink then you can always modify and say then you can find that your rice is going to get overcooked yeah your, it's going to get burnt yeah. okay so you can always modify in a language mm-hmm. that the patient is able to relate better to yeah okay so yeah. i i always feel like sometimes um the stories that people choose to tell you are very indicative of how they perceive themselves and what's going on internally so you know someone is constantly um remembering a story of a very difficult time and they had no support and yet they managed to succeed and why can't you know others do the same um it actually to me it speaks of someone who was crying for support and had no choice so learned to be dismissive of that behavior entirely that breaking down is not an option it shouldn't exist are these the kind of experiences are there more that you could maybe share when when it comes to dealing with male patients definitely definitely because mm. one basic difference between how men and women relate to all these uh, emotional and psychological problems mm-hmm. is that women i feel are more amenable to listening to advice sharing and this thing and i feel they are more receptive to uh, advice and psychotherapeutic uh, 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 options kind of thing okay yeah whereas what i have seen with men is that basically they don't speak the language of psychotherapy that's one basic difference i've seen in men because they i feel they always want to retain the sense of agency control and other things 
So you can't go on about uh, uh, telling men about, see, you will have to do this. This is the right way to do. You have to do this. No, that, that kind of uh, telling men to do doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. What works best is you will have to be with the men. Okay. You'll have to be with the men and you'll have to guide them on their journey towards uh, 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 overcoming this particular emotional disturbance and kind of thing. So oh, I feel that's one basic essential difference uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Whereas women are more, it's, you, you can actually tell them to do. I basically feel that it's easier treating women than men mm -hmm. because women are very obedient. Okay. They are very good students. Okay. Mm -hmm. You give them a ho homework when you do cognitive behavioral therapy. They are the best students you can ever get. Okay. They do it perfectly. I want you to fill up this form. I want you to do this chart. Come back in a week's time. They will do it perfectly. They are model patients. Mm -hmm. So it, this approach does not work with men. Okay, you will have to yeah. slightly tweak the models that you... Women, men are looking not for explicit guidance, but uh, mm -hmm. they, they don't like to do homework. Okay, they don't like mm -hmm. to fill up scales, maintain thought diaries. No, that kind of approach doesn't work with men. I think there and is an essential difference between... But they why are do you think action. that is? I, mean, is I it... feel, I okay. feel the... I feel the way that men want to be shown how to improve from their psychological distresses by uh, uh, being on the ground and doing something because mm -hmm. they would like to retain the sense of control and mm -hmm. agency. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, being in charge of the treatment, not being told mm -hmm. at every step that this is what you have to do. You'll have to do this. You have to keep these thought diaries. You have to do this. Come back in a week's time. I feel that takes away from the sense of agency kind of thing. Yeah, so, yeah, and that that itself is a social construct as well, right? Exactly. That, uh, exactly. Yeah. So, in terms of masking behavior, or you know, internalizing uh, trauma or pain, or I mean, even if we don't go to um, a big event trauma, but even small, small things which over time build up and they themselves create uh, pain inside. Is this masking something we're just born with, or is this something that we learn over time? There are certain biological differences, okay? Mm -hmm. So that has a, a say in how we react to stress us. And then there is also the uh, uh, social environment that determines how we are going to respond to uh, distress. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference in the way between how women and men uh, respond to uh, emotional distress. For example, most often we see that men act out, they have more anger attacks kind of thing rather mm -hmm. than women okay mm -hmm. of course we do see women uh, who are angry and talk back to this thing and throw things around and kind of thing yeah and then the men come and say no doctor it's difficult for me to live with this lady she's always angry kind of thing okay and then we know that there's something which has triggered this we don't take mm -hmm. everything as face value mm -hmm. and then when you talk alone to the uh, uh, girl you find out that there's something chronically which has gone on to trigger this and then we find out and kind of thing same mm -hmm. thing happens with men also stress has been going for a long time and then they react this way for example mm -hmm. uh, they take to they numb it with sedatives alcohol kind of mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. second thing is they drown with themselves with overworking okay so partying hanging around with friends if they're very young college mm -hmm. university students so these are the slightly different ways in which men react to emotional yeah. distress. You, we all have our coping mechanisms. Yeah. 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 And does media play a role in uh, the way in which uh, men choose to handle emotional uh, fluctuations? Yes. I think by reinforcing the stereotyping behaviors, you're a man, mm. you will have to take it on the chin, you have to different uh, react differently kind of thing. I think this stereotyping the role of men during a distressing situation has definitely played a role. But off late, I feel, especially movies and those kinds of things, but off late, I would always say there are two situations where there's been a very welcome change. One mm -hmm. is after Sushant Singh Rajput's uh, thing. Mm -hmm. If you tease away the negative coverage on what happened, uh, the thing, 
the discussion behind uh, Sushant Singh Rajput's uh, 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 demise and uh, yes. what actually led to his demise, uh, the discussion about bipolar disease and depression and probable drug abuse, I think uh, uh, in the popular lingo on social media, mm -hmm. that has been a welcome change. Mm -hmm. The more recent case of uh, uh, the friend star Matthew Perry, all the coverage that I've seen has been very positive after his yeah. death in contrast to what uh, Sushant Singh had. Mm. So people have, there's been overwhelming uh, pouring of positive support, uh, even though he died because of a drug overdose. Mm. I've always seen very positive coverage, so which is a very welcome thing that I've seen. So I think yeah. these are the things that uh, spark off welcome discussions on how people have to handle this. So as a support person for a male, whether it's your son or your husband or even a colleague or a friend, and you're seeing um, signs of emotional dysregulation, um, you know, just, just small things like, you know, um, a very unhealthy relationship with one's boss, and you're seeing that it's taking an emotional toll on, you know, the male person that you know, are there ways in which... Um, even if you're a man, you know, and, you know, you have a male friend, are there ways in which you can guide this person to take more support? Because, you know, men are often a little close. And I've tried this in my own experience yeah. that they don't really respond well. But are there things that you could use to maybe highlight that um, this sort of support is needed? Yes. I think the first thing is to recognize who is in need of support. Okay. The warning mm -hmm. signs, as we all say. Somebody is sloppy in work, okay? You need, you recognize some behavior changes like anger attacks, okay? Mm -hmm. Somebody has started using more sleeping pill, mm -hmm. alcohol kind of things. Uh, those kinds of things. The first sign of this thing, okay? Relationship problems, interpersonal issues in mm -hmm. office or at home kind of thing. I think that's the first step that uh, we recognize this person has an issue. And it's better that somebody talks to them kind of thing, either at workplace or other thing. How we give that support is also very important. For example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever support that we provide to men, okay, has to be provided, I feel, at the workplace. So emotional support, psychological support is always best provided for men at the workplace. Mm -hmm. that, that's how we catch them best. Or in schools and colleges. Exactly, schools and colleges. Younger. And other yes. Things. Yes. Mm. Okay. So, uh, employee assistant programs where mental mm. health is also part of their uh, annual programs. We we provide assistance to all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And older men, I think there are a lot of these things. For example, one important uh, uh, step towards improving the uh, mental health of women has been these women self help groups in India. Mm -hmm. But then we don't have similar concepts for men. Whereas in the West, these uh, 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 men's sheds concept have caught up where mm -hmm. men get together they engage in common group activities they discuss things there'll be somebody visiting it the particular men's sheds and they discuss issues yeah in a friendly manner kind of yeah. thing yeah so i think just like we have the didi groups in india we must also yeah. have these kind of groups for men Dada groups yeah exactly yeah. so that yeah. should happen kind of thing are there um you know i know tears and certainly constant crying um that's usually a sign that something's getting uh, unregulated yeah. but are there other things um you know the disruption of which might point to more severe issues like um sleep exactly. is another i can think of yes okay when crying can point out to more sinister causes is that when of course constant crying Mm -hmm. can sometimes happen in bipolar depression yeah. okay which is the most serious version of unipolar depression okay that mm -hmm. needs medications and more uh, specialized help and uh, there is a condition called uh, pathological laughter and crying okay so that is a neurological condition where because of uh, multiple tiny lacunous small strokes in the brain mm -hmm. the patient cries for every uh, 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 this thing, which is involuntary laughter kind of thing, okay? Mm. That basically happens in small uh, subcortical strokes in the deeper parts of the brain, mm -hmm. where because the uh, uh, 
uh, deeper parts of the brain are cut off from the inhibitory effects of the cortices of the brain. The patient uh, uh, loses the capacity to regulate emotions. So the more common variant is, is involuntary crying for every emotional mm. uh, situation. The more rare variant is involuntary laughter. That points to a more sinister brain diseases like strokes, rarely multiple sclerosis, or even more de uh, serious causes like uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and kind of things. So yeah. that yeah. is a sign of a more serious brain disease. And 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 are there any other factors that might point to say building depression? Uh, because depression is also a growing uh, condition yes. happening today. Yes. Um, yeah, the usual common uh, things about depression are you have physical signs like uh, inadequate sleep, mm. loss of appetite, constant tiredness, fatigue, lack of energy. You you stop enjoying the things that you have previously enjoyed and give up on a lot of your hobbies and other things. You're not able to experience any positive emotions or pleasure. Mm. You feel actually sad. Your mood becomes low. Nothing is able to cheer you up. You have difficulties in concentration, uh, absent-mindedness. Mm -hmm. You have negative thoughts of worthlessness. Uh, you have guilt. And uh, uh, you have uh, hopelessness about the future. And if it becomes very severe, you have uh, thoughts of self-harm. So these are the usual constellation yeah. of symptoms that constitute uh, depression. Yeah. You know, I often think um, that something that people miss is how beautiful and how productive a human being can be when their emotions are well regulated and their um this stability within in that sense you know i remember like i waited till i was about 34 35 to get married and uh, i never looked at um, job titles or income titles or religion i wanted a man who could cry i mean who would find tears to be beautiful in himself and in others. I mean, for me, I thought that that is very important for stability and joy. Is that scientifically true? Is there any medical um, evidence that shows that men who embrace all emotions and can regulate all, all manner of emotions, um, that they actually become better husbands, better sons, better workers even? That, that's a very tricky question, okay? so Because you keep reading uh, these studies, no? They yes, say yes. a man who cries yes. has less anger tantrums. Um, I think it's true, yes. but I don't know if it's medically yes. true. Yes, there, there, there is a large uh, 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 body of evidence that says that mm -hmm. people who cry are uh, have more empathy, okay? But then what happens is there are also studies which say that... Uh, uh, what we cry on also changes as we all grow age, we grow older. Okay, so when we are young, we cry on hopelessness. We cry when we when we are sad. Okay, but then as we grow older, what happens is that we start crying for more positive things. So I think it's a changing uh, yeah. uh, uh, thing. So, yeah. Yeah. That there is a, a yeah. lot to say when you um, yeah. encourage anyone to really accept and acknowledge yeah. and express yeah. all emotions. Yeah. And I really hope that at least after this conversation, uh, people will think twice before saying man up. And maybe the exactly. response will be, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for everything you shared. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Does it bother you when you say, you are too stressed to go to that party or you can't complete that project on time and your partner or family or boss doesn't understand. Well, it bothers me. What I have found is that it helps when you see those who dismiss emotional limitations as those who are coming from a generation where toughness was admired. So when they say things like mental health is a 21st century product, I also try to hear those words with compassion. How does someone offer you something that they never experienced themselves? They had no choice. A very quick dismissal of mental health support can also just be that young girl or young boy who had to convince themselves that their difficulties, their tightness was all nonsense. 
just so that they could find that strength to earn, to nurture, to live. And perhaps our pressure cooker is bursting in other ways, you know, the growing lifestyle diseases we have or insomnia or irritability, but that's their journey. It's really important that you don't let that impact your journey and how you connect and feel about what you feel. Do you think mental health limitations are a valid reason to give someone a break? Or do you think it's just increasingly being used as an excuse to get out of things? Do let us know your thoughts. You can write to us at pods at indiatoday.com or you can message us on 8588-966-996. And if you enjoyed this episode and it added something meaningful to your life, please do rate us. We are available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts.